Babe Ruth got old. Played for the Yankees, crushed it, killed it, won a ton of, ton of championships. But like all athletes and all human beings, came to a point in his life where his uh, <clears throat> physical abilities began to deteriorate. And during that time, the Yankees traded him to the Boston Braves, and not a lot of people talk about those years for Babe, they weren't the best. Um, but Babe Ruth went on to play for the Boston Braves, and it was just, he probably should have just retired. Uh, but while he was playing there, one of his last games against Cincinnati, he played terrible. He was striking out left and right. He had caused by himself the opposite team to score five runs. And so after he struck out for the last time, he began to walk off the field, dejected, a shell of his former self, head down with booze just showering him, people yelling obscenities, shaking their fist at Babe Ruth. And walking off the field dejected, a little boy jumped down from the stands and ran to him with tears streaming down his face. He ran up to Babe Ruth and he grabbed onto him and he clung to him. That's loyalty. That is loyalty. Not when we embrace people when they're on the top, but when we can cling to them when they're at their worst. If you were here last week, at the beginning of our series through the book of Ruth, you know that Naomi doesn't just need a hug. She needs a long embrace. She doesn't just need a, oh, it's going to be okay. She needs somebody, a friend, somebody, enter Ruth, who is loyal, that will cling to her when she needs her most. We all need friends. We all need loyalty in our lives like that. And so Ruth chapter 1, left off at verse 6, says then she, after her husband has died and her children have died, arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. How sad it is when people hear about the blessings of God, but don't experience the blessings of God, because they're not in a place to when we hear about the way God is doing this or that or blessing, and, and we're not in a place to receive those blessings. I worked with a lady um, at a financial institution years ago who was Hindu. And man, stuff was going crazy at this financial institution that will remain nameless but got outed not too long ago for being super shady. And so there was lots of pressure on this bank. Managers were pressuring employees, and employees were pressuring other employees, and all of a sudden, all kinds of not good stuff was taking place there. Dishonest things were taking place, and amen. This lady, a Hindu background, came to me and said, Jimmy, how in the midst of all of this effort are you still smiling? How do you have peace? How do you still have joy? And I told her, Jesus. And before I left that job, we ended up going out to eat with a group uh, to an Indian restaurant. Believe it or not, I love Indian. And we sat down at this Indian restaurant, and, and she, she asked to, for me to give her more detail. And so I got to share my testimony with her and how God took me from darkness and brought me into the light and, and showed me who Jesus really is. And uh, through that conversation, she looked me in the eye at the end, and she said, Man, you've almost convinced me like King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. You, you've almost convinced me. So whether it's you're a non-believer and you aren't experiencing the blessings of God because your heart is far from God or you're a believer who is wayward and because you're wayward you're not in a place to receive the blessings of God. And, uh, I 
can remember living in Spain and serving in Spain and, and working there in pastoral ministry. And I remember because of just I was a young idiot, I got fired for ministry. And it was a, a, a dark time in my life. And so I left Spain and went back to Southern California. And while in Southern California, I had a lot of time to think about what an idiot I was. It's one of those crazy things where you hear from afar the things that God is doing. And you hear from afar the way that God is blessing. And you realize that you're missing out on those blessings because you've chosen to be a moron. It's a crazy thing when you hear about the blessings but aren't able to experience them. Experience them. Abraham in Genesis chapter 13 had to leave Egypt and return to the altar he had left. Jacob in Genesis chapter 35 had to leave where he was to go back to Bethel. The prophets all throughout the scripture are calling God's people to leave their sinful lifestyle and turn back to the Lord. Sometimes we got to recognize and realize that we need a turning point in our life. And they recognized that they need a turning. They need to turn. Naomi's decision to return was the right decision. But her motives were wrong. You see, she was still chasing food. And not a loving relationship with the Lord. Naomi uh, was still uh, primarily interested in things that were um, fading away. You don't read of her confessing her sins. You don't read of Naomi tearing her clothes and crying and mourning and seeking the forgiveness of God. You don't read that of Naomi. But you read that she hears there's blessings in Bethlehem and God has visited and now there's food and so I guess I'll go back. She was returning to her land but not her womb. And so Naomi, verse 8, says to her daughters-in-law, Go, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them and uh, lifted up their voices, and they all wept. Let me ask you a question. Why was the land of the Lord good enough for Naomi, but not Orpah and Ruth? When you read a passage like this, and Naomi realizing that God's arrived. God is blessing. I'm going back to the land of God. Why is it good enough for Naomi but not for Ruth? Instead, Naomi tries to convince these two young, impressionable women to go back to uh, their land and their families and, check it, their false gods. I don't know very many believers that are like, yeah, I just go keep Go, go keep following that false God. I, I'm going to go pursue the true living God unless they're in a place of hurt, pain, and bitterness. And that's exactly where Naomi was. See, I believe that there are, there are a couple reasons Naomi wasn't trying to bring them with her. I believe there's a couple reasons Naomi was trying multiple times to get them to go back. I believe, uh, first of all, she didn't have a plan. She couldn't even take care of herself. How was she going to take care of her daughters-in-law? But I also believe that she was trying to convince her daughters-in-law to go back to their land, back to their people, because she knew that if she brought these two Moabite women, which Deuteronomy chapter 7 says that her sons should never have married, if she brings them back to the land of God and to the people of God, the people of God are going to look at Naomi and realize that she and her husband had made a mess of their life. And far too often in the church, we don't like transparency. We like to hide our sin, hide our guilt, hide our shame, rather than confess it and experience freedom and forgiveness. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you come in these doors and, and there's some stuff you're holding on to. And you don't want anybody to know about it. And so you try to suppress it. You try to send it home instead of putting it on an altar and allowing it to be dealt with. And so she tries to get her daughters and say, just go, just go away. Just go, I can't, I can't take you with me to this place because everybody will know the compromise of my family. I had a, man, my best friend in high school, his name was Jacob, and um, Jacob Lisi, super Italian. 
right? And uh, we were inseparable. We did everything together. We even came to the Lord together. We both, he recommitted, I committed. We were Christians. We were holding one another accountable. And then one day, he stopped talking to me. I'm like, what's this new problem? So I'd show up at his house. I'd give him a call. I, I, I tried numerous different, we didn't, I don't even know if we had email back then. This is I don't back to, but I was, oh yeah, seriously. I was trying, the two way, the pagers, I'm paging him. Some of you don't even know what pagers are. But I was trying to reach this guy. I'm like, we were best friends. We were best friends. And now he's disappeared off the face of the earth. About a week later, I found out that the reason I couldn't get a hold of him is he started dating my cousin. Which I wouldn't mind, except for the fact that my cousin wasn't a Christian. She wasn't a Christian. He had compromised. And in compromising, he was trying to hide his sin from me so that there wouldn't be that accountability. There wouldn't be that speaking into his life. And we so often do that with our sin. And part of it is because we do a poor job as the church of lovingly accepting people and praying for people and walking with them through their issues. But there's another part of it that you cannot escape and you cannot get away from. And that is that we do not like to deal with our sin. And when we do sin, we like to do it in private and we like to hide it and we don't like people finding out about it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes it will find mercy from the Lord. <coughs> we'll find mercy from the Lord. When we try to cover our sins, it, it, tells, it tells us this about ourselves. It tells us that we're not ready to face our issues. We're not ready to, to allow God's word to shine its light into that area of our life. like Adam and Eve in the garden. They sin, they fall short. Now all of a sudden there's this, this separation between man and God and they're feeling the effects of their sin and so they try to hide it, they try to cover it, they take fig leaves and they're trying to hide behind bushes as if they're playing some kind of cosmic game of hide and go seek. Like God can't see where they are. Adam, where are you? You know, whatever, right? They're, they're hiding their sin. There is such freedom and liberation when we confess our sins one to another. That's when times of repression come. That's when times of healing and hope come. When we're willing to admit we're wrong. When we're willing to admit that we need help. And they said to her as she's trying to convince them, go your way, just, just get out of here. Go back to your land. Go back to your people. They say to her, no. We will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is exceedingly bitter to me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Here, Naomi having a pity party, but also trying to think logically. Look, if I just like conceive miraculously right now, <clears throat> what, are you going to wait 20 years? Are you going to wait? I don't think so. Just go. Just leave. Just go. God's... His hand has gone out against me. And the tragedy here is that Naomi is not even trying to paint the Lord in a good light before these ladies. Not even trying. Just keeping all the blame on God. We love in our bitterness to blame God for our issues. People, I was just, I was just talking to some homeless guys as I was waiting to print these $8 notes out. Here in the Spanx, it's a big one. And they were outside there, and they're, and they're talking, you know, and, and um, man, it's just like all the issues of their life. And I'm going to talk to these guys, and and, uh, and one of them, you know, he shouts out at me, hey, you know, I'm just, uh, got, you know, tell him who I am and what we're doing and all this kind of stuff, and, and, uh, and tried to encourage him. And he's like, where is God? Where is God? And I 
I said, the question, my friend, is not where God is. He's always been where he's always been. The question is, where are you? Where is your heart? We love when times get difficult, when the obstacles of our life are challenging to blame God. Even people who didn't give a rip about God before, living it up, living for themselves, then all of a sudden, they hit a wall and they want to blame the God that they don't even believe in. It's interesting. There are people who I know, people who have even come to this church who are no longer here because they faced very, very difficult challenge, the loss of love and have left and have left there is no greater opportunity to bring God glory than while in your trial you cling to him that while in whatever you're going through this morning that while in that you can still praise him and what's tragically sad about this story is that had Naomi perhaps in walking with God, Orpha may not have ever left. <clears throat> she may not ever have gone back to her false gods in her pagan land. If Naomi had been walking with God, perhaps as she entered back into Judah, as she entered back into that land, she would have had two trophies. Instead, verse 8, turn. Verse 11, return. Verse 12, return. Convincing these ladies to leave. Naomi was so bent on believing that God was out to get her that she lost sight of the fact that God is in the business of taking backsliding wanderers and turning them into glory stories. That's what God does best. He takes us at our worst and makes us trophies of His grace. They lifted up their voices, verse 14. And they wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother in law, but Ruth clung to her. And as you read the passage, you begin to wonder was Orpha's heart ever really in it? Or was it always somewhere else? Ruth, not Ruth, Ruth clung to Naomi. Ruth would not let go of Naomi. It's interesting that, that Ruth's name literally means companion or friend. Orpha's name means back of the neck. Ruth, friend, companion, companions. Orpha gives her her back. Are there things in your life that you continually return to? Are there some things in your life, perhaps even people, that you continue to go back to, even though you know it's the wrong way? Is your old life still pulling you back? says that we are called to make war against the flesh. So what, what separated Ruth from Morphe? Why did one choose to stay and one choose to go? I would submit to you as you take the entire passage in its totality that, that the answer to that question is suffering. They had been through a lot, were going through a lot, and things were not about to get easier. At least in their estimation. See, suffering will separate the real from the fake. Every time. Every time. Jesus would preach messages and thousands would leave. He's like, how can we get them to stay? He's like, now how can I get them? How can I find out who the real from the fake is? And he would preach. And so, so we even have, sometimes we have these crusades, which I rejoice in. 
I am a Calvary Chapel guy who, um, Greg Laurie is, is one of our crusade preachers that go, that he preaches at the stadium, thousands of people come to know Christ, but, but you don't know who really has come to Christ, and I don't mean to get Debbie Downer on this, but until some time has gone. I've known a lot of people who've gone forward at crusades that, that haven't walked with God in the long run because they end up being like the parable where seeds who are sprinkled here and, and then they just die out. And there are seeds who are sprinkled and the birds come and peck away. But over time, it's when you um, begin to suffer loss. It's, it's when your friends leave you. It's when you're called to break up with that guy or that girl. It's when... You're not invited to as many places that you begin to realize, man, am I really a Christian? Am I really all in on the things of the Lord? I love this story, true story. Um, when, when Russia was, it was still um, closed, their country, uh, the KJB used to come, KGB used to come into underground Christian meetings and arrest uh, individuals and put them into prison as Christianity was outlawed there. And you can read of stories in Russia where KJ, KGB with their, their masks down and machine guns would burst into um, underground churches and they'd say, all right, anybody who's not a Christian, get out of here. And more than half the room would leave. And after they left, and the doors were closed, they'd take their masks off, put their guns down and say, okay, let's have church. To separate the weak from the child. To know who's really real and who's just playing the game. Because in America, we can play the game, but there are other countries all around the world that you can't play that. It's not worth it pretending to be Christian. You don't gain from it. That's why you find people who have different life experiences, and you'll see even we, we had a baptism. Um, but we had a baptism in here. And there were some people who were, I mean, they were screaming while they were being baptized. And some thought, oh, they're just being Pentecostal. No, listen, here's the difference. It's not even cultural. Here's the difference. You see, for some of us, myself included, we grew up in the suburbs, and in the suburbs, you know, you're, you're, maybe your family's believers, and it's just kind of that nice, that, that nice transition. And, oh, I'll receive Jesus too, and so we receive Jesus, and then the next natural next step is we baptize, and then we get baptized, and it's like, ah, oh, that was nice, wasn't it? Let's go out for some eggs Benedict. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful, beautiful story. But for others, that's not their story. For me, there was no sacrifice in being baptized. I wasn't losing anything. I was gaining everything. But for others, that being put into the water and coming back out, that represented losing everything they once held dear. Family members, friends, who will now disown them. And the body of Christ then becomes their family. said, verse 15. See, your sister-in-law had gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me from you. I mean, that should literally be the definition of loyalty in the dictionary. That is loyalty. Verse 18, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth was the real deal. Ruth was the real deal. She had experienced Moab. She had experienced the false gods. She had experienced a life full of debauchery. But she recognized, even within Naomi's bitter heart, that there God dwelt. 
There are five women in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. And as you read through his genealogy, you see these five women. Four of them were super suspect. You had Tamar, who we talked about last week. She was just incestually making love to her father-in-law. Super weird. Um, you had uh, Rahab, who was a prostitute. You had the wife of Uriah, who was an adulterer. You had Ruth, who was an outcast Moab. And you think to yourself, as you, as you look at this list of people in the lineage of Jesus, you think to yourself, how did that happen? Why would God, in his providence, allow these type of shady characters to be in his lineage, to be in his family tree? It's for the same reason you and I are but by the sovereign grace of God. And we get to call our God, God. That we get to fellowship with Jesus. Because God, by his grace, has extended his hand of love and mercy towards us. That's why. Not because of anything we did or bring to the table. It's all God, always Jesus. Even the fifth one, even Mary, who loved their man. She didn't deserve anything. She may not have had the checkered past or the skeletons in her closet, but there's nothing she did. She didn't volunteer to be the Virgin Mary. <laughs> she didn't want to go through that, right? But God chose her to be a part of his lineage. Because 2 Peter 3 9, it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come. To repentance. And so the two of them went out until they came to Bethlehem, verse 19. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Man, underline that first part of verse 21. Highlight that in your Bible. Because it is true of everyone past, present, and future. That when you go in to the Lord, He will fill you. But when you leave, you will remain empty. You will go away full, but you will return empty. Again, bitter people love blaming God. Was it God's fault for the calamity that she was experiencing? No. No. It was the consequences and ramifications of her own decisions. And if she was going to blame anybody, she should probably blame her husband. But God, come on. Uh, Naomi, in verse 22, returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. I would have loved to have been a fly in the sky to hear the conversation that they were having on their week-plus journey of back to the land of God. What would they have talked about? Would Naomi have been sharing with her what the law of Moses was all about? Would Ruth be asking questions like, what are God's peoples like? What, what, what's God's land like? What, what am I in for in my new home? What would the answers have been from a woman who was as bitter as Naomi? I don't know what their conversations were, but what I do know is Naomi returns, and when she gets there, uh, the women ask, is that Naomi? Verse 19. Is that Naomi? I mean, they couldn't even recognize that it was her, and only 10 years had passed. Listen, we all age quite a bit in 10 years, but not like unrecognizably aging, right? They, could, they couldn't even realize, who is that? Is that? My goodness, it looks like we've been through it. Right? She, she had gone through some stuff. The ten difficult years in Moab took a toll on her appearance. I remember sitting down with a family member of mine years ago. And I sat down with her at my desk and I pleaded with her in tears. I said, listen, the direction you're going in is going to lead to destruction. 
Proverbs say, if, if you cannot learn from another's mistake, you're a fool. I've made a lot of the same mistakes you're making. Don't go down that road. And she didn't listen. She didn't listen. And fast forward all these years later, it's been over a decade, I'm telling you, she is unrecognizable. The effects of sin, the effects of heroin, are still, to this day, presently, taking the life of one of my loved ones. Sin will destroy you. And you don't think that when you dabble with it. You don't think that when you start dipping your toes in the water, and well, it's not that bad, and I, I still go to church on Sundays. And But the reality is, fast forward 10 years from now, you may very well be unrecognizable if you choose to dabble Naomi comes back, and her childhood friends didn't even recognize her. Call me Mara, she says. Her name, Naomi, literally means pleasant. And she's like, no, 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 don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because that's what I am. And that's what I am. Exodus chapter 15. You don't have to turn there, but, but I'm sure you remember this crazy story. The sea had been parted. God's people had been freed from the bondage and slavery of Egypt. And as they, they, they got through there, it says that, nobody ever remembers this part. They wandered in the wilderness, the desert, for three days without water. I want you to think about that for a moment. That would be extremely difficult to go one day without water. But imagine wandering aimlessly for three days with no water and nothing in sight, the anxiety that must have been gripping you at that time. And then finally, God's people, Exodus chapter 15, they arrive at this body of water in this place called Mara, where the water in that place was undrinkable because it was what? Bitter. It was bitter. That has got to be the ultimate slap in the face. You find that in three days, like, what are you running? and you're just spinning it out. It's disgusting. It's bitter. And the people begin to cry out to God, and Moses begins to cry out to God, and what does God tell Moses? God's like, oh, throw that stick, throw that piece of wood into the water. And so Moses throws the stick into the water, and then all of a sudden the water is not bitter anymore, and I know what you're thinking. That's weird. Yes, it is. But God does a lot of crazy things like that. Right? But, but when he does those things, he doesn't just do it to do it. Sometimes I think he's messing with us. But he, he just he throws us in. He didn't just do it to do it. He does it to teach us lessons. Lessons that we'll be able to hold on to and walk through life with. In Exodus chapter 15, there at the end of verse 25 and into 26, it says, There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them. This is after he turned the water into like drinkable, purified kind of stuff here. And he put them to the test. Verse 26, he said to them, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and you keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so God, in that place of bitterness, brought about healing. Life for the Egyptians was pretty bitter at that time. When you find yourself wandering, you will often find yourself thirsting. And when you find yourself thirsting and you're outside of the will of God, the water in which you will drink will always be bitter. It'll always be bitter. No matter how much you drink or no matter how many wells you try to drink from, apart from Christ, the waters of this world will always leave you dissatisfied and longing for the true and living water that only comes from Christ. And here they are. The water is purified. The wood is thrown in and healing took place. 
What other piece of wood turned bitterness sweet? I think of the cross of Calvary, where God defeated sin and death, where he conquered and triumphed over all of our messy lives. And then, and only then, verse 27 of Exodus 15, it says, and then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm springs. It sounds like California. Uh, there's 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. They're like, I'm saying, like 10 here, palm trees, fresh water. This will be home for a while. After having no water and bitter water and then getting some purified water, we're hanging here for, for quite a long time. Um, Listen, we cannot control the circumstances of our life often, but we can control how we respond. We don't always have a hand or a play in the cards that God deals us, but we can respond, control how we respond. That's what faith is all about. Daring to believe that no matter what cards we've been dealt, God can work all things together. He can, and He does. Naomi was accusing God, the Almighty, of dealing bitter with her. And she calls him the Almighty, Lord, all throughout, you notice that? All throughout the passage, referring to him as God, Almighty, the Lord, El Shaddai. And it just goes to show that you can know the name of God without trusting in his name. She returned bitter and almost allowed her bitterness to isolate her and keep her from community. But she would realize, as Alexander Wise once said, he said, the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. This was Naomi's new beginning. This was Naomi's new beginning. And you need to know here this morning that it is never too late for a new beginning. I don't care how far you've gone. It has never been too late for a new beginning. The Lord is always there with open arms. That's what the cross represents. Forgiveness. Acceptance. Will you come to Jesus and experience those times of refreshing? And let me close with this. The difference between a prodigal and a pig is that the prodigal may play, play around in the pig pen for a while, but he doesn't make his home there. Naomi struggled with bitterness. And you may be here this morning, and you may be struggling with bitterness yourself. Know this, that God can take and use your bitterness, your hurt, your heartache for his glory. you got to know it. you got to believe it. He can do that. Paul puts it this way. Paul says that, that, but we have this treasure, Jesus, in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And we have the tendency as believers to try to uh, dress up our earthenness. To clean up our earthenness. To paint the vessel, to glaze them, to shine them, to polish them, when in reality, the most powerful witness is the one that says, listen, I've got issues, I've got problems, I make mistakes, I have flaws. We don't glory in those flaws, but we're transparent enough to say, God accepts us all. If you would just come to him, the Bible says times of progression would come. That's a promise from God. It's not just me spouting something off from behind a lectern up here. But that is a reality straight from the word of God. That with repentance comes refreshing. Who in the world doesn't want refreshing? You'll have that opportunity in a minute. When we can say with transparency that I am flawed, but I know one who is perfect. I know one who is all loving. I know one who is all merciful and all gracious. I know one who is all forgiving and able to save. And 
chapter 1 ends, the thing finishes with this statement. And they came to Bethlehem. Look what it says there. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. See, what could have been a depressing chapter ends with hope. It ends with hope, you see, because barley season <clears throat> took place during the Passover. There is no greater time and no greater way to come to the Lord but through a time of Passover where we're able to, to come to the God who not only covers our sins but takes them away. The Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. What a wonderful picture of how non-believers and bitter backsliders can come to experience that peace, that joy, that satisfaction. It always starts with recognizing Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb, the one who's taken our sin and taken our judgment. We don't got to carry it around anymore. The bitterness, the hurt, the shame, the fear, the anxiety, the guilt, you don't have to carry it around anymore. Come to Jesus. Naomi is dealing with her brokenness. and She is in need of healing. Can we be a church where people can walk through these doors and experience just that? Hope and healing. Not because I'm a good or bad communicator, not because we have a good or bad worship team, but because we have a good God. We have a good God. May we be Ruth's and Naomi's. May we be loyal friends who are willing to walk through the trenches with one another. When we're at our worst, not just our best. May we be like that little kid who jumped out of the stands and embraced Babe Ruth when he was at his worst. Everybody will give him a hug and a high five and ask for an autograph when he's crushing 60 plus home runs a season. That's when we're at our worst. 